Wonderful. Can I have audio, please? Ah, great, it works. Ha! So, you all know the old camera your parents had. You have, maybe? Your grandparents had? The thing where you open a, a lid and put in some stuff where the images are stored on. It's not a digital memory, it's an analog, it's a chemical process. Um, it's not dead, it's quite alive. Um, it's again more and more used. Um, there's still some pro progress in development. Um, and uh, Mimoya and Dasha are talking about um, Mimoya comes from an IT background and instead of, you know, this meme, um, how to get into woodworking, you start working in IT. Um, she came to working with silver, silver halogenide, to be precise. Um, yeah, mit, mit, uh, uh, with Dasha, she made a talk uh, in 2018 on the CD as well about analog photography. So sh they both have a bit of background. Um, yeah, a warm welcome to the two and to the talk about analog photography. Well, hello everyone. I'm glad that so many people are here. I have to say I was kind of uncertain whether this topic would even be interesting to the crowd and I was not certain like who to address, like people who have already a lot of knowledge, people who might be new to the topic. So I hope there's uh, something interesting for all of you. Um, first of all, uh, before I start talking about the actual topic, I want to say um, like I'm going to talk about the state of analog photography, um, recent developments on the market, which I've been following the recent years because it's interesting and of course I want to know what nice stuff I can get for myself to use. And uh, later Mimoya will talk about uh, how to scan a film because it might seem straightforward, it is quite the opposite and uh, she's been nerding out quite a bit and <laughs> about this topic and it's uh, very nice. So um, before I start with the actual topic, I want to say a short disclaimer. I'm going to mention various companies who make film, who make cameras, um, even a, an online store, which I sometimes use. I'm not affiliated with any of them. This is not meant as some kind of advertisement. I'm just talking about the stuff I use. So yeah, if it seems like there's affiliation, no, there is not. <laughs> I was wanted to say that. So it's 2022. Why would we actually want to use analog photography? Is it cost reasons maybe? Not anymore. Uh, I would have actually argued like this a few years ago because film cameras were dirt cheap on the used market and um, they are already outdated so they kind of don't age uh, and digital, digital cameras do age. Uh, they are outdated after a few years so it might even be cheaper to just buy you a lot of film every now and then. But I would not argue like this anymore also because it's um, become more expensive actually. So is it maybe quality reasons? Well, that de depends on the definition of quality. Uh, I mean, photography is art, so yeah, ask 10 people, get 11 opinions. Um, and you have technically measurable aspects like resolution and you have aesthetic reasons, which are the important ones for me. Uh, in most regards, I would say digital cameras are better as in the technical specs. So that's maybe not an argument either. There are a few exceptions like ultra large format, which we see here, because if you have a like eight by 10 inch sheet of film and you scan that with a very high resolution scanner, well, maybe there are digital sensors who can compete, but you will have to look for them. It's not easy. So this ultra large stuff, is actually maybe a reason why you want to use it. Is it practical reasons? Um, 
Well, I can't think of much except one, because if you uh, use film, you can use a camera which doesn't require batteries, which can be very handy. Or I have some uh, batteries last for like a year, and digital cameras you have to charge like every two days or something, or carry a lot of batteries. So yeah, that might be kind of uh, an argument. So maybe technical reasons. Well, somewhat because uh, if you are shooting analog, you can do true black and white, which you digitally usually can't because you always have this RGB pattern in the sensor. You can do creative stuff like process your film in the wrong chemicals. Um, I have in my notes unpredictable creative shit, um, like multiple exposures over time, intentional light leaks, wet scaling, which is exposing the film on the wrong side. You can do a lot uh, if you want to. And you could also use uh, some DIY just for educating yourself, like if you want to learn about the process, about the history of it could be interesting, so yeah, might be a reason. Or is it aesthetic reasons, for which I would say hell yes. Um, and I would say it's like you can draw digitally and you can draw on a canvas and then probably digitize it, like scanning or something. Um, and both are valid. It's not like, oh, drawing digitally is better or drawing on the canvas is better. No, that's not the case. Um, and neither is superior or inferior, so I want to avoid some uh, hipstery analog is better because it's always what you like and um, you what you want to do with it. Um, and <laughs> also what it is about artistic expression, not self-portrayal, at least for me. Uh, personally, I like it better, like the images speak to me, which digital images usually don't. And I also like black and white photography a lot because um, it's kind of easier for me. I have less factors to worry about. Like, is the white balance right? Do I need to filter or something? No, um, it's just black and white. And I also love uh, the aesthetics and haptics of old cameras, like using them, handing them when you uh, wind the film. It it's just feels nice to me. I, I just enjoy it and it's about fun. That's really the point for me. I don't, I don't do it for money, I do it for fun. Um, I also like that uh, analog cameras usually do not have menus because I, I really, really hate menus uh, when I just want to take pictures and I'm fiddling with the menu and yeah, then maybe my picture subject is gone when I have found the right setting. So yeah, uh, I do not like that. So uh, the market situation is uh, what I want to talk about mainly um, because of course you need suppliers for your cameras and also you need the cameras yourself. Uh, first of all I want to talk about the makers of film where we always had and still have like the big three companies which are Kodak, Fuji and Ilfo. They've been like around, I've, it feels like forever, they're all still around, they're all still making film, never really stopped. Um, there are smaller manufacturers, uh, for example, Ardox, which is a German company, uh, Ferrania, which is an Italian company. I think they're also in business again. Um, there is Orvo. Some of you might know them. It was the uh, film manufacturing plant in the German Democratic Republic. They still exist and actually they uh, are starting to make camera film again, like in canisters that you can just buy. They used to just make cinema film, but you can now pre-order and next month they actually want to ship camera film that you can just put in your 35 millimeter camera. And when I read that, I checked like three times if that's true, because uh, I think that's awesome. Um, that a small East German company now does more stuff again and uh, realizes there's a market. Um, Oh, no, <laughs> I was too quick. Uh, we also still have Aqua, but they only make technical products, like not for still photography, more like for aerial photography. Sometimes they are repackaged by uh, third party uh, manufacturers. And there are also a lot of resellers, uh, which makes the market situation at the supply chains often kind of unclear, which I'm unhappy about because I just like knowing what I'm actually putting in my camera. <laughs> Um, yeah, the low point uh, of um, 
the market has uh, been quite overcome. At this point, I would have loved to show you like some uh, graphical display uh, of a curve that is going up again. Sadly, I could not find any data uh, that would be presentable, um, like real facts, not just, oh yeah, it's, it's going up again. Um, what I can say is uh, that the demand is actually exceeding the supply. Uh, Kodak, uh, who have of course downscaled the film production when um, people went digital, they can't make and especially can't package film as quickly as it is sold. It's often sold out uh, these days because they just can't make it as fast as people are buying it. Which I think is, is quite amazing. I wouldn't have thought it a few years ago. Mm. Also, they sometimes now have supply chain issues like um, they can't get the film canisters or some metal parts are missing. That is actually a current problem. I just read about that. And yeah, manufacturers downsize their capacities to keep it viable and now people are buying more film again, so they have kind of a problem. Now what formats of film can you still buy? Um, oh yeah, that was my point. <laughs> I should have prepared better, sorry. Um, you can buy still black and white film, you can buy C41, which is color negative, which Probably most of you still know those brown strips you get back from the lab. There's E6, which is uh, positives, dear film in German. Um, it also still exists, so expensive. And you can get these films at least as uh, 35 millimeter, which is what we see on the right. Most of you know that. And you also have the 120 format, which is, I think it was introduced in 1901. It is still around and is still quite popular. And you can also buy sheet film for like these large format cameras I showed you earlier. Um, yeah, so most decent cameras built in the like last 70 years can still be used because you can still buy the film you need for them. And they're also mostly repairable. Um, what also still exists, for example, is cinema film, which is a bit different. I do not want to go into detail about that right now. Um, you have 110, which is these Mm, like small cartridges, more for toy cameras, but it still exists. Some people like it, why not? And you also have uh, instant film, like these Polaroid uh, thingies. They are also still around or again around. I just can't really tell you about it because that's something I personally don't use. So yeah, I don't wanna um, just tell something which I don't know about. Uh, cinema film is sometimes inofficially repackaged for still photography use. Uh, some companies who do that are Sinistil or Silbersalz. I still want to try that, but yeah, I haven't so far. Of course, we've had a price increase, uh, especially in the last few years. Everything has gotten more uh, expensive and so has film, which, um, for example, is due to increased prices of raw materials, of course. Like I said, everything gets more expensive. You have ecological reasons. Um, for example, some companies uh, can't manufacture the film uh, according to the recipe they used to use for it because, yeah, some chemical is now prohibited uh, and they have to re-engineer their stuff, which, of course, doesn't make it easier and doesn't make it cheaper, usually. Of course, there's inflation. I don't have to tell you anything about it. You know that. Um, but uh, the really interesting thing is, it's if you compensate for the inflation, film nowadays is not really much more expensive than it was in its heyday, which we can see uh, in the graphic. I hope it's self-explanatory. Um, so yeah, that's also an interesting point. Uh, it's like it's not expensive now; it just used to be dirt cheap, and uh, of course we all love that, but now it's uh, like, now it's at a point where it's viable again, which is nice because uh, companies can do research and development, which is of course in our interest, and um, they don't have to operate at smallest profit margins anymore until something breaks, uh, because sometimes even film companies had to stop production of some product just because the machine broke and they made so little profit that they couldn't afford repairing the machine, which is not nice either. Um, so I have some price examples. These are for 35 millimeter film, so you'll get 60, uh, uh, sorry, 36 images usually per film. 
black and white you can get for around four euros which i think is pretty cheap and it's like it's not crappy at all you can pretty much use uh, these cheap films a color film has gotten more expensive now it starts at like seven euros and often it's sold out <laughs> um there is slide film which is expensive you don't have much choice and also few reasons to use it there are reasons to use it but also that's uh, something i don't want to go into detail about right now so is this a rich people's hobby i actually wouldn't think so i mean you have seen the past examples um those of, are used to shooting digitally and think oh i want to take like 500 pictures a day i don't know i don't have the problem my problem usually is like, oh god i still have like 10 images left but what do i shoot i want to develop this film i, I want to have it done so yeah i think one gets used to it of course we also need cameras to put our film in some of you might still have them some just want to start out you and of course you need a camera Uh, the last major manufacturer of uh, an analog camera was Nikon. I wanted to show that because I thought they would still manufacture that model. But um, it was a Nikon F6, if anybody knows that one. I'm a Canon user usually, so <laughs> I'm not familiar with it. And this was discontinued in 2020, sadly. Um, yeah, like I said. Um, we have Lomography who do creative film stuff and also uh, build cameras. Uh, some of them are like cheap toys, but you also can get somewhat decent cameras from them if you like this uh, kind of stuff. There are some small scale manufacturers, which of course are expensive, but hey, it's nice they exist. And then of course, uh, there's the used market. Oh, sorry, I <laughs> was too quick. Um, the used market has quite increased in price too. I'm following it a bit, but there are still lots of cheap options if you're not so picky. And as an example, I've just looked for like a Canon EOS uh, series cameras with a lens already on eBay. Like I said, that's no advertising at all. It's just an example. Um, They are also somewhat compatible with modern lenses, which might be important for some people. And yeah, I mean, you see the prices. You can get uh, like a camera for 20 to 40 euros and you can just have fun with it. I'm not saying these are the greatest cameras, but they are cameras. You can take photos of, with it. What more do you want? No, we have, uh, we have film, we have cameras, we have taken photos, hopefully and we want to process it. Uh, for color film, it's still pretty easy. You can just go to the drugstore, uh, drop it and get it back like a week later, later or something. It used to be like next day stuff. That is not a thing anymore, but still if you wait a week, you can get it for like three euros per roll, which is dirt cheap, if you ask me. There are some uh, special labs there which I would prefer because uh, you can actually talk to the people who run the machines they put your film in. I kind of like that. Um, they usually start like from five euros a roll um, for development only. Actually, more of these labs seem to be emerging again. Uh, I'm getting like advertisements for that. And many of them also offer scanning your film. So you just drop it and you get your digital images and you do not have to do what Mimoya does, um, which is of course also part of the fun. But I mean, I sometimes just don't want to fiddle with scanning. I just need my images quick. Don't want to use digital anyway. So yeah, that's a nice option. And yeah, you can also home develop color film but it's not really viable for anyone because if you don't have at least like I would say four to six a month it just isn't viable yeah, the chemicals will go bad faster uh, than you can use them and they're not that cheap for black and white film there are also special labs which uh, I would recommend drugstore development for black and white isn't really a thing it might work out I wouldn't try and actually <laughs> And of course, there's uh, home development, which can be really, really cheap. Uh, depending on the chemicals you use, I can easily do it for way under one euro per roll. And 
cheap developers does not equal to bad developers. The image quality is rather decent. It's really just more a question of preference, not of quality. Like you don't get much higher quality with a much more expensive developer. It's just a matter of taste. So yeah, that's what I usually do. And I yeah, have screenshotted, like again, no affiliation, from um, a major German store for these kind of things. And they sell you uh, like the um, canister you need to put the film in for development and the chemicals, like everything you need to start out for 45 euros. You can of course get it used, but I mean, that's a one-time investment. I'm still using the tank I built uh, about like 15 years ago. It's perfectly fine, so yeah. Um, that's kind of affordable, I think. So now, <laughs> the classical way to reproduce a negative would be to use an enlarger. I, most of you probably know what that is. I'm not going to explain it now. But of course, we also want to show around uh, our images digitally because like we are in a digital age, uh, stuff gets that distributed on the internet, so we need a digital copy of it. And yeah, like I said in the introduction, um, scanning film isn't as straightforward as it might seem. It's quite tricky because there is not a right or a wrong way to do it. And yeah, I mean, we could also enlarge them and then scan the <coughs> enlargement, but that's, that's just another step. Why do it? Uh, we will probably lose quality. Yeah, so now for scanning, Memoria, please. Okay, hi. Um, scanning your film. The big question, of course, in the beginning is why would I need to scan film? We can just go to the drugstore, get copies, maybe even point on, yeah, we, we want it on CD, um, even though I have no way of reading a CD in 2022. Um, we can do that. So why would we scan at home? Yes, we can home develop. There are multiple reasons to do those. Um, I personally had just the experience that I went with my film to my lab with my first film, um, they took, I gave it to them and I waited two and a half weeks. And I'm not the person who can wait two and a half weeks for photos. I forget what's on the film, I forget why I shoot it, shot it, and yeah, I even got it back with a comment saying that my pictures were great. I don't want that. I want my pictures to stay with me. I'm a bit of a paranoid person in that regard. And in a film lab, they have to manually process that film, which is totally fine, but you can scan at home so no one else touches it. If you home develop, you should home scan. Also, you want to post your pictures online, you need a digital copy. So let's talk first of all what goes into scanning, because like, if we go nerdy about it, let's optimize every direction we can. Um, we want to scan in the highest possible resolution with the best color accuracy. Sure, that's, that's obvious. We will have a picture, we want to get that picture as precisely reproduced as possible. And maybe even we have mistakes on our picture. Dust is a big major, uh, in, a big um, factor in analog photography. If you have dust on your film and you do an enlargement, you get that dust spot on your enlarged image. So some scanners offer optimizations to reduce that dust, to reduce anything else that might be on the film, to, and to correct for things like film aging. Film aging is actually a thing, like film from the 80s, especially slide film, will have aged up until now, and you might need to correct for that to get an accurate image what was on the film. Also, there is software, and I, I think everyone can agree here, software can be a real pain. And if your scanner, like many film things from the 90s, comes with software from the 90s, and that runs only on Windows 2000, Windows XP, and something like that, that can be a real chore to work with. Besides that, stuff that is from the 90s, the early 2000s, and isn't built anymore, that's expensive and usually super slow. If you had at the time like Thunder Earth, no Thunderbolt available, but you're putting your data through USB 1.1 or Firewire 400, if it is a good, uh, as good of a scanner, you're waiting for your images to arrive. And there are multiple scanners that try to deal with that. There are multiple categories of scanners. Um, but before we look into those, we need to define resolution because resolution is like the, the obvious thing to look at. Um, there is a test chart that the US Air Force defined in 1951 that is giving us a possibility to benchmark optical systems. Scanners count as optical systems and all our scan setups count as optical systems. So we can use that chart. That chart gives us black and white stripes that get uh, finer and finer. And the last, the last uh, set of stripes where you can distinctly understand which ones are the white stripes and the black stripes, that is where your scanners can still reproduce at the highest contrast that the scanner is possible to process um, a difference between white and blue. 
black. So that is what we use to get an optical resolution test. Um, scanners and optical systems usually have lenses and other stuff that is in the way of the light. So you have optical losses. And those optical losses are usually what prevents a scanner from reaching the actual resolution it is advertising. You might have seen scanners from the early 2000s, mid 2000s, I have no idea, promising 9,000 DPI resolutions. Yeah, they usually don't reach those. There are optical losses involved. So what resolutions do we actually need to scan film? That's difficult because film is silver halides, silver halide crystals, and they have different sizes depending on the speed of your film, so how light sensitive is your film. And depending on your developer, your developer might accentuate those grains and give you more and bigger grain structures. So if you sample a grain with like four pixels, you get an accurate representation of that grain. Um, so if your grain is bigger, you need, a, in theory, a higher resolution to get everything out of the film. There is a good upper bound if we say for black and white color film, 8,000 DPI, uh, that is like on, on an, uh, 8,000 pixels upwards on a small 35 film uh, negative. That is roughly where every film is peaked. You, you should be able to sample every film that uh, crosses you uh, around. Um, but uh, there are different scanners and every different films, and they have all their different uh, specialities. And usually, if you say, I scan at 4,000 DPIs, you get a good representation of, of what is on the film. So let's just go with those two numbers. You can completely sample every silver grain, but if you want the image, 3,000, 4,000 DPI is usually where you would max out for that. Um, but for color, that's difficult. It's not like we can say, yeah, that's a number. If you sample at that number, you get a good result. Um, we already heard there is light film, DF film, positive film. That film is pretty much accurate in the way it is. It comes on a tra transparent base, not the brown strips you might know. Um, that transparent base lets light through, and you can calibrate for that specific film light base. Uh, yeah, base, and, and then you have an accurate representation. There are uh, calibration targets you can buy for Kodak and Fujifilm, the two big manufacturers of slide film to this day. Um, you calibrate your scanner to that. You, it has different checker patterns of the different colors. And if you then scan a positive uh, film, you, get, you should get a good representation of the colors that are actually on that image. That's pretty easy. Black and white negative, also not that bad. You, pretty much have to define, this is my black point, this is my white point. Software is not bad at doing that. Um, that's just basic histogram checking. Or a, a manual operator can easily do that by hand. The thing is, color negative film, the brown ones, they're evil. They come on a brown base to help you offset some shortcomings of how the emulsion represents color, which means your negative inverted is not directly what is on the film. So you need a strategy to compensate for the issues that come with how the film is manufactured. That seems easily enough. You figure out the math, and then you go with it. Sadly, it's not like that. Every film has its different characteristics. They have their different formulas. They have the different colors they use to create the image. And those colors behave differently. Some films might accentuate red tones. Other films might give you less saturations. The next one gives you more contrast. You can't have a one-fits-all solution because film ages, as I said, and a film from now and a film from 10 years ago will not render an image exactly the same. So there are best guesses manufacturers of scanners did um, that you will just have to trust them um, for a different scan. Let's take an example for those two images. Um, the upper image is a Kodak Pacon scanner, the lower one is a Norizo scan. Two manufacturers of scanners, um, expensive scanners. That's not like that's not putting your phone over a light and just photographing it. Those are expensive lab scans if you were to get them done in a lab. Which one's the correct one? So that's difficult to say, right? I, I, I couldn't tell from, from here. The lower one, yeah, I, I got a white. When I was there, I would say snow is white. That seems right, but I also know that my film that I used to photograph, that was a cinema film that is accentuating blue tones. So if my final image has more blue than, it, than, than I would expect, maybe that's just the film overcompensating. Am I now working backwards against the film or do I just accept it that my film is rendering more blue? As my, you can see that in the upper one, the camera decided, okay, I'm using no base point to, to do white balance against, while in the lower image, you have a perfect white for the stripe of the passing Berlin S-Bahn. So 
I couldn't tell which one is correct. I don't know what is on the film. I can look at those two images and decide, yeah, which one I like better. And that's the issue. We can't just go around and say, this is perfectly what is on the film for color negative film. There are strategies and there are manufacturers with their strategies and there are corrections and all of that. But in the end of the day, it is a question of art. So let's go to, through the process manually. Um, we have a raw scan that is like six by six medium format on a very specially chosen film. This is Lomography 400 and I chose a picture that was especially green because I put a filter on so we c we're using that picture later. This is not as bad as you would likely see it in a real life example. This is like a specially crafted image for that case. So what do we have in a raw scan? Okay, raw data, that's a yellow brownish picture. We do have a couple of color informations. Okay, cool. But at this point, the scanner already decided what its dynamic range is. It has already lightened or darkened the image according to what it read during scanning. We need to keep that in mind. So we could be at the point where the image is too light or too dark because the scanner has already compensated for us. If we now just go and invert that image by just pulling our curve upside down, that's blue. That, that's a blue image. I don't want a blue image, but that, that is the point where the yellow base of the film just breaks our image. We need to compensate now for the, the yellow base. Okay. That's easily done. We, we subtract the yellow base from every pixel. We have a green image. We, we, just, we just put out blue. Why is it green now? Now we have different ranges of our colors where the color material exists. And we don't know if like the actual black that we are seeing in the shirt is actually the blackest black in the image or if that is like a dark gray. And we need to make an assumption. In this case, I just moved all the sliders around to where actual data was and the image looked good. So. If there was no, on the red channel, there was no data. I just moved the black, point, the black point of the red channel to a point where the data began. So what was you, probably 30% black saturation before now becomes my new no black data at all. That strategy I did manually and I came up with an image that to me looks quite nice. You might disagree, perfectly fine. Um, that is like how you could invert an image, very basic manually. Um, the, the difficulty is if you're now not doing it manually by editing the curves, but you're using scanners or a lab, you might get different results. From left to right, that is like a, a solution for Lightroom that already inverts the image. And I said, yeah, I want a very saturated image and I want the colors to pop. Because why not? I, can, I have that slider. If that software gives me that slider, I'm allowed to use it. I get a very red, brown, oversaturated, contrasty image. I use the same image with a different software to convert it and I get a brown greenish image. In this case, it was uScan, a software that runs on Windows and Linux and talks to desktop scanners that gave me that image. And then I gave that image to a lab and they scanned it on two professional lab scanners and I asked them not to correct. And I would say that one scanner gave a pretty perfect result. So maybe they did correct, maybe they did not because the other lab scanner, that's green. So an operator now has to manually step in and, and correct that image by what they think you want your image to look to be less green. That's why I want to scan at home, because I want to do that step manually. If I'm going to correct it anyways before posting, because it is my image, I might want to correct for small details, do post-processing in Photoshop or Lightroom or whatever, then I can also do color correction. So that's the point where we need to, correct, where we talk, need to talk about automatic correction and film grain, because as we talked, we can sample film at some resolutions and we will get the grain. For black and white, that's pretty easy. We, either we have a grain there, we, or we don't have a grain there, or we have different sizes of grains there, but that's somewhat binary-ish data on one layer. For color film, we don't have that. Um, for color film, we have those blobs of data all spread around and they align roughly to form a color. So there are different ways how we wanted to, might want to correct that. And one of the solutions that the late 90s, early 2000s produced was the Digital Eyes software suite. Four, four software solutions to deal with those issues that might arise when you are photographing a film. Digital Eyes is the first one that emerged and that's the most popular. That's the dust and scratch removal. You just shine an infrared light through your film base and your colors will not influence that infrared light, but dust will. So you get a mask that you can use to automatically correct and do a fill from, this, from around the data, uh, the data around your scratch to fill in new color information. And you get the scratch removed. Um, there is the digital ROC, rest uh, restructuring of color, 
if your film is aging, if your film might be shifted in color due to development, that takes care, care of that. Um, gives you a software suite, gives you some heuristics and so on to get the color right. Um, and then there is digital gem, grain equalization and management. And I want to focus on why we might want to manage our grain. Um, because why wouldn't we? Would we? We wanted to have the film and we want the data from the film. And now we agreed that maybe the color of the film is personal preference. Are we now having to manage even what the film is all about? Um, let's zoom in into the, uh, you know, to our pictures. That is what I'm talking about. That is not digital noise. That is grain noise that we have on the film. I scanned this picture multiple times the first time I got a high resolution scanner because I couldn't believe that looks like camera, camera noise. No, it's not. It is actually multiple colored blobs that are on the film. Now, I think it's 2000 times magnification. That is like a half frame image. Um, so we are zooming in quite a bit, but that is how our film is made up. And for a very modern film like the one to, we are seeing here, that might not even be a problem. No one is zooming in into that that much. Um, that might not be the case if we are looking at an old film. That is a film that came, into a, came with a camera from the 70s and the film was, was from the 80s. That's like one of the earliest color films. And if you zoom in, that's horrible. That, that is a grainy image that is all over the place, looking like noise, green, red, and blue chunks. Those things you might want to correct. Also, those purple borders around the image, that's from the aging of the film. As I said, those are worst case examples I could find in my stash. Um, probably you won't find something that is looking that bad with a modern film. So we, we know what we want to correct for. We know roughly where we want to go. Let's throw money at it. Sounds like a usually good solution for all things technical. Um, so we have different scan type, scanner types. We do have the scanners the labs are using. We do have flatbed scanners. We have seen those at home. They, they should work. They are scanning something. Um, there are dedicated film scanners that are desktop machines you could buy in the 2000s or even sometimes later that were designed to just scan film at highest possible resolutions. And we have the creme de la creme, the drum scanners, or the virtual drum scanners. In this case, that's like how they look. That's a one and a half meter tower of pure awesomeness. And you pay roughly the same like a, of a car of it. Um, that's a Hasselblad FlexTide X1, X5. Um, they had multiple versions of that. There are actual drum scanners where you uh, mount your image onto a rotating drum and just sample one color line at a time. Different ways of how they work. They produce the sharpest images, the best images, but they're so expensive. As I said, 25,000 euros base price. If you can get one now and you have to get it with a box and a manual, and the manual tells you that the power supplies are consumable. So, ouch. Um, if you even can get replacement parts, they might cost you a thousand a year. Um, there are labs still using them saying they never had an issue and there are others who have to replace something expensive every year. I don't own one. I, I only were able to talk to people. It has a 10,000 pixel scanner line, the flex tight I talked about. So on 35 millimeters with a bit of um, uh, lenses in between, you get an 8,000 DPI scan. That's pretty much the best you can get for, for uh, 35 millimeter film. If you are now using that same lens to focus wider and use the same scanner line on a medium format image, like the six by six centimeter ones we saw earlier, we get a 3,600 DPI res um, resolution on medium format. So that's good. That's pretty much the best you, you can do for, for, for small images. You can do better for medium format, but that's not really an option if you want to get into it. That's not really an option ever, unless you explicitly want that for the karma points. Okay, so let's buy a lab scanners. They are fast, they are quick. They are optimized for speed. They, they work in a lab, you put in your film. Also, that was a test film, no worries. I'm usually not putting that, my film into that bad of a situation. Um, but yeah, those scanners were built to pass film through them all day long. Norizzo has this line where they have a scanner they call HS1800. And the 1800 means 1800 small format frames per hour. That's a frame every, uh, every half a second on not the highest resolution, but that scanner just pulls film through, which means you might not even get the color accuracy you would expect from that kind of scanner. But now every lab has them and that kind of software and the Norizzo scanners were pretty popular and they give you a nice color feel. They, they render your film in nice colors. So people now expect the inaccuracy of the film scanner with their analog scans. So yeah, we've come full circle. Now we are correcting for the scanner that someone in the past used so, because, so we can get the look in the future, whatever. Um, 
this is one of the standards I looked into. That's a K, uh, K, um, codec Pacon. Um, at only 2,000 euros, if they work, this one was broken when I got it, they are stupidly expensive and they require you to run Windows XP and it's a complete mess to work with. Um, the driver registers its own partition. You have to mount a different drive into the machine, give it its own partition. The driver will take over that partition, use it as RAM replacement, then open a comm server, connect to it via the DLL, putting around a, a different UI application. So you have like 15 places where this whole stack can crash and it does, and it does. So they are not, no fun to use, they are clunky. And if you don't have the absolute optimized virtualization setup that magically works, you're waiting forever for your images. So desktop machines, they were made for the, home, uh, for the home user. Let's get that one of those. Okay, they were optimized for results. They are quick uh, to, in, in the way they work. They are not super slow, but they are slower than lab scanners. They take a couple of minutes to get a big scan. Um, and what we're seeing here are two scanners from the Nikon cool scan line, which were like state of the art when they came out. The upper one from the early 90s, we got for 10 euros on eBay. It is a DS scanner and someone put it into an Apple CD drive because they broke the casing. Whatever, it still scans 30 years later. Um, not as great as a modern one, but it works and they're dirt cheap. And those scanners, they work on multiple operating systems. They can scan with uh, ViewScan for Windows and Linux, a third party operating, uh, third -party operating software. And they even uh, are supported insane. The, insane the Linux scanning application. Um, though the CoolScan 9000 only has a driver that was posted to the mailing list in 2008, so you have to patch your SANE manually and integrate that driver into the built environment. But that works, you, you can scan with that. And you end up with a scan with three color layers and an infrared layer if you want to, and then you need to convince GIMP to work with that. But that's a different problem. People using GIMP usually know what they're doing, I don't. Um, but those scanners exist. They range from 10 euros on eBay to four and a half thousand when I looked it up earlier today. Would not recommend. That's expensive for a hobby. Why, why would anyone buy that if it is not for the taking apart? So we had flatbed scanners. My dad had one of those. I, I, I lent that one. Um, there are different scanners that were built to scan uh, negatives. We have the, the Scanon 9900F um, that allows you to theoretically scan at 9600 dpi's. You never get that. Um, if you put in 9,600 DPI's, you roughly get around 2,400 real DPI's of optical resolutions out of it, which is not bad. That gives you quite a bit of zoom in. Like for this six by six negative, the, that is quite a bit of data we got out of it there. Um, but it's not perfect. Also, if you scan at 9,600 DPI's, six by six centimeters, that's a lot of storage data. You end up with a gigabyte per image. You need, you need to compress that. So you throw out every fourth pixel or something with all the downsides of digital image processing, digital image compression. compression. That's a topic for another talk at some point. There's also the Epson scanners line. They are pretty popular. They have their own accessories. Co community has built extensions to those. Um, they are even still sold. The V600 you can still buy. They are pretty fast, they scan at good resolutions, the V800 or 850s, they were the ones you get recommended. At 800 euros, they are not cheap, sadly. But you get 2,600 real DPI's and you don't have to scan at the highest possible resolution. At the highest possible resolution, the scanner is introducing noise because the heat it creates is higher, so at scanning at lower resolutions gives you a better result. Hmm. Okay, but yeah, they work with Linux. They work on with the same driver kit. You can do that um, if you don't want to use Windows and Lightroom. And the modern solution, if you maybe even have a camera at home, is just pointing it at it. You put a light table on the, on the floor, you mount your negative over it, and you use a good camera to scan it. We set 4,000 dpi for a color negative. That's roughly 24 megapixels. That's, that's a modern camera. A modern camera can do that. Yes, we do have losses to, through the lens, but you can op obtain pretty good results with a very minimum fin financial effort. That's my digital camera. I think with a seven, 70 euro lens on it, that worked for me pretty fine until I figured out scanners suck and they have software to break. So th that is still my, my go-to way if I just want it to work. 
you can use it with anything that reads SD cards, cool. And there are converters, things like Negative Lab Pro, which integrates into Lightroom, so you import your images, cut out everything that is not the, your color negative, you click Convert, and you have a couple of profiles. It simulates pretty well how the different lab scanners of the time would have processed that image. They just reverse engineered how the uh, software window did the color corrections and, and uh, integrated that into that software solution. And if you have crazy money to throw around, for 10,000 euros, you can buy a Hasselblad scanner or you can buy a medium format digital camera with a good macro lens. You get pretty much the same resolution at the end of the day, but one of those things is one meter 50 high, weighs 70 kilos, and you can't move around and you don't know if it works tomorrow. And the other thing is a camera that is actually workable as a camera. So that is what I would recommend for anyone who wants to get into scanning, unless you already have one of those flatbed scanners. Um, flatbed scanners have the disadvantage you need to have a light, 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 light that the scanner is able to shine through. You can't just put a light on top of your negative and hope that the scan will work out because the scanner will try to compensate for the reflection it is registering and will completely erase anything that is on your negative. But if you have a scanner like the ones mentioned, a Canon 9900F or an Epson, those work. If you are just here trying to have a camera, bought a 30 euro camera, just mount whatever you already have, even if it is a phone or an old compact camera, fix the focus, fix white balance, and start shooting your negatives. It works. Um, yeah, that is everything I have to say for scanning. Let's compare it between two scanners. On the left, that is a, a view scan scan. On the right, that is a, a scan from a camera. You can see software. You can basically see how this different software decided what to do with the colors. On the left, it is less saturated. On the right, it is more saturated. Um, I wouldn't say there is a big difference in detail. At least from the last rows, definitely not from fr the front here. That's perfectly fine. That's a 35 millimeters uh, image that is 24 megapixels scanned on the right side. And on the left side, it's a 4,000 TPS scan. So a bit uh, more data if you store it as TIFF, but still roughly the same. Um, so let's zoom in. If we read the text, that's pretty much the same sharpness across the board. Um, both work. The, one, the difference is one is a 4,000 euro investment up front that gives you a nice workflow, and the other one requires you to mount a camera somewhere over your negative. You beat the touch of it. I like the technical challenge of taking apart scanner drivers, but I would not do it for the results. Um, so yeah, you, if you point a camera at it, you get decent results. Though you don't get this, the whole suite of digital corrections, your camera will not have an infrared sensor that allows you to correct for dust and uh, scratches. So that is the one downside of DSLR scanning that might, for some people, give, give them a reason to buy an expensive scanner. But all things considered, that is everything I have to say for scanning. Um, thank you so much. I hope you have a great day. Goodbye. That was awesome. Thank you. Uh, we <laughs> still have uh, about um, 30 minutes time for some Q&A. I guess some people will have some questions. Um, yeah, so when I was looking at uh, scanning options, um, that weren't too expensive. I mostly found like devices that uh, would allow you to mount a phone to uh, scan your film and like rotate the film uh, next to the phone camera. Have you ever used one of those? And are they decent? Or so, sorry, could you could you how do they mount it? Uh, I haven't bought it, and I haven't uh, so I haven't had much of a chance, but um, uh, to actually look into it too much. But I think they kind of let you move the film to scan multiple uh, photos after one another. So, so basically a, a roller setup where you put the film in and you, you roll it forward? Or, or what, 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 what I, I absolutely, I don't understand what device we're talking about. I think it's a cheap piece of plastic, but I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, so, so just, for, just where you mount the film and you, you scan through it with a camera? Uh, you mount your phone then to you the... Oh, your, your phone, sorry, I understood film. Um, I tried one of those, 3D printed. 
they are horrifying in so mel multiple ways because you lose so much dynamic range to the, your phone's camera, you get your phone's correction for what the phone is thinking you're photographing. Yes, Kodak has its own app that is trying to read raw data from the camera. It does not work out that well, so, sadly. Um, it is good enough to understand what's on your pictures. It is good enough to post online. It is not good enough to reason why to shoot uh, analog photography for me personally. I did l not like the results, and sadly they don't give you accurate color representation due to limitations of the phone's camera. Um, but if you were to completely over-engineer that with a good phone where you maybe even can put an external lens on, that might work. I have not looked into the go-crazy option on that. Uh, hello. Yeah, um, I'd like to ask about a kind of painful part of the process, which is software to me. Uh, because I looked at uh, scanning some of my films quite a while back and a friend of mine had, you know, a decent flatbed scanner and we tried that and it was quite frustrating, not, not very sharp. And so I, I did go the same route that you recommend of like mounting a camera, but at the time it wasn't a particularly amazing camera. It was like a micro four thirds camera from, you know, way back when. And um, it, it seems that you, uh, that, uh, if I understand it correctly, that now there's like Lightroom plugins or something that manage the color correction for you, because I really struggled quite a lot actually getting the color correction for the color film. I ended up actually mounting um, like Lee filters, you know, like the, the, the color gels that you mount on lights, that is like roughly the opposite of the film base, so that my camera would have enough dynamic range. But, you know, I, I wouldn't be sure if that would be at all um, a viable strategy now if there's like you know, film presets? Um, no, I would personally not do it with a filter because modern cameras or somewhat modern cameras gives you, give you a lot of dynamic range. You can even do like an HDR photo of a film negative, which means that your base color is never completely blown out. You should always have uh, color information, color data, brightness information on those borders. So you can just white balance from that border mm. and then you get a negative that you can invert. Um, you can use Negative Lab Pro, which is doing fancy uh, saturation, saturation curves across the whole range of colors for your image. But like, as, I said, as I showed in the, in the one slide, just inverting it manually and subtracting um, the, the, the color base and pushing in the, the borders so your color data is on the range where you would expect it, um, usually works out. So no, I would not go with a filter. Yes, that plugin exists. It costs money, it is proprietary, though it is Lua software. Um, so, yeah, there, there are multiple options there. I don't think I would go with a filter just because of the amount of light that it would lose. So, I'm pretty much a noob at this, but say I assume I were to want to develop my own film at home. How does that even work? Um, it's pretty easy. You have uh, like a development tank with a spool. I had it in my slide, but it's yeah. You can you can kind of make it out. Uh, you have this uh, roundish uh, thing on the right, which is a spool, and you basically just need uh, a dark room or like a dark changing bag. These also exist. I just like to use my bathroom, shut the door, shut all the lights off, so it's really perfectly dark. And then you use this room to spool your film in, in total darkness. Um, put it into this uh, black tank, which is a development tank. And at this point, you can already um, like uh, turn the lights back on. And for black and white processing, it's pretty easy. You have uh, like the developer, which goes first. It, um, you, can, you can find like the dilutions and the time uh, required for your film online. There are huge lists. I can recommend the one at digitaltruth.com if someone is interested in that. And um, yeah, then at the end of this development process, you pour it out, pour some water in, just to make sure everything of the developer is out. And then you need fixer. I'm not going into the chemical process at this time um, because that would lead too far. And yeah, you leave like the fixer in for maybe, I usually do it for eight minutes. 
pull that out, and yeah, then you can you take your finished uh, film out, hang it like over your bathtub maybe, so it can dry, and yeah, that's everything. And in media, you sometimes see them developing film in rooms with red light. How come red light doesn't affect it? Um, the thing is that silver highlights, which uh, film is based on, also color film, uh, which is a bit more complicated, but it also uses like uh, silver highlights, so some uh, silver chemicals. If you use them as they are, they are only sensitive to blue light or ultraviolet light. So you have special chemicals in the film, which make it make, make it uh, sensitive to other colors of light too. And at this point, you can choose which chemicals to put in. So you can, for example, put in something that only makes it sensible uh, towards uh, green and yellow light, but it's not sensitive to red light, which means red light doesn't affect the film, and you can develop, um, well, you can practically uh, watch the development process under the red light because the film is not affected by it. But you can also go into the other direction. There's even film which is sensitized way into the infrared spectrum, which makes it even harder to uh, process because, for example, in labs, they sometimes use like infrared goggles to check the machines while they are running. But you can't do that with infrared film, which needs complete darkness, of course. <laughs> And uh, yeah, it's an interesting topic, but that would be another talk. Um, yeah, so that's that's basically how it works. And uh, the word uh, you might come across if you look further into it is uh, panchromatic and orthochromatic. Panchromatic is like for all uh, sensitized for all visible light colors, and orthochromatic is not sensitive to red, but to all the other colors. And yeah, I think it's kind of a cliche and probably also a movie trope because. Yeah, shooting, showing a, a red lighted room just works better than showing a black room. <laughs> um, I have some experience with lab, with photographic lab. Yeah, the, the, the thing with the film and into the spool and developing the, putting the film in the canister that is, has to be in complete darkness. But after this, um, the photographic paper, and that's what you meant, why this red light or brownish whatever line. This is when you, when you print, when you make the image on, on a paper, this is sensitive to only a very specific part of the, of the spectrum. And it's not sensitive for, for red light. And this gives you the, the possibility to you, you put the image on the, on the paper and then you put it in, into the developer bath and you see how the picture comes, how the image develops and then you process it. This is, this is actually how you, you do black and white in the lab. You have this red light or greenish whatever. It's not, and the, the, the paper is not sensitive to this light. So you can see. It's really, really fascinating to watch every time. I love it. Yeah, me too. <laughs> So there is actually a point where I have to work blindly and okay and but only a small part does it have to be like entirely dark or if I have very good vision in the dark like tiny bit of light destroys it destroys it okay yeah you want complete darkness usually you you, <laughs> you, you, you place your stuff on on a table You know where your spools are, where your canisters is, where you, your film canister is. And you memorize, that's how I do it. I memorize it. I go out, I switch out of the line, and I go in, and I grab <laughs> what I have to, to take, and the scissors and, and stuff, and so it's a bit of a training. Yeah, one really gets used to it, and by now I don't think it's hard particularly at all. Yeah. It's really, it's really a question of getting used to it. Yeah. Well, still one minute. Last question. Uh, quick question. And uh, now you showed only how to scan decent photographs. Um, have you any um, in, uh, information about? Fa for uh, I'm looking for a uh, slide scanner because I've many cupboards of slides, uh, positive and black and white. So I want to run them automatically um, within frames. 
I looked at the reflector, but uh, yeah, they are still very expensive, and uh, the Linux support is not that well. Yeah, you, you run into exactly that that hole you, you mentioned. Um, I am not aware of a scanner that is scanning DIAs from a stack cheaply. Like yeah. you do have the cool scan series, <laughs> but you spent two thousand euros on it. Yeah, it, and, and more. Um, especially you, if it's called a Chrome. Yeah, especially if it is coded Chrome, then you will you want that kind of scanner for that because it's the one solution to scan that very old particular film in a good way. Yes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if you have old film, get an old calibration target. It works with cameras to a degree. That's also a comment for if you do it with uh, not a ready-made scanner, like for example uh, the mobile phone thing and some light source, I think you always should have a calibration target. So you have a printout of a lot of colors where you get the scanned numbers of the correct, what's this type of red, green, whatever, and do the calibration because you have three um, sets of color sensitivity. It's from the film itself, it's from your camera because uh, the pixels on the camera are not sensitive to the same wavelengths um, as then the third one, your illumination is. You have to be very careful about the illumination sources, both about the frequency and, and that wave content, if it's not a uh, Wolfram, whatever sensitive thing, that you have a, a wide spectrum. And then you always should do calibration with a target. Take your camera, your film, take that cal uh, calibration thing and then uh, you can calculate backwards that you get the real colors. Yeah, but that, that is basically the, the rabbit hole, right? If you spend 500 euros on a, on a color source and then you only mount your most expensive slides and then you use your phone, then you have invested at the wrong point. <laughs> um, so yeah, of course, you can or should calibrate for your slide film if you want to do accurate slide film representation for color negative. I tried it, I don't really see the benefit in it. It is just expensive to get a calibration target. And at the end of the day, you will just do it differently for the uh, color anyways. Your software will decide, or you will decide what you want to see in the picture. So why correct for the 1% if you're going to flip 99% of the color information anyways? I think you already have profiles for your scanner and the film you're using likely. Um, this is a question you can discuss afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's very interesting as always. Uh, get into analog photography and <laughs> applause for the two of them.